Ferrites are sold as the magic cure for supply noise. But what if they can actually make your supply more noisy and less reliable? I used ferrites without second guessing for decades in my 31 year career. Until I finally investigated and found out I should have been paying a lot more attention. In this video I'll show you real measurements on test boards and explain the simple theory behind what's happening. And as a bonus you'll see a capacitor surprise that can make things three times worse if you don't know about it. So you can avoid all these problems completely. So let's look at ferrite models first so you know what you're dealing with here. <sighs> Not again, my AI still doesn't get what I mean by models. I'll do it myself again. So let's look at this model of a ferrite bead. It looks quite complicated, but let's do a simple analysis to see what this thing does across frequency. At low frequencies, the capacitors have a high impedance, so you can basically remove them. And the inductors have a low impedance, so you can remove the resistors across them. You end up with the LF model. We can do the same for high frequencies. There the inductors disappear since their impedance becomes infinite and the capacitors become shorts. C5 basically shorts most of the circuit now, so you're only left with 990 femtofarad and 23.2 ohms in series. This is the high frequency model. In between those two extremes, there is a slow transition with a parallel resonance in the middle, caused by L7, L8 and C5, creating a high impedance, in this case of 1000 ohms, which is huge. So be Below 100 MHz it behaves inductive and above it behaves capacitive. It's very important to realize that different ferrite beads have vastly different frequencies at which their impedance peaks. The height of the peak also varies drastically, so always check the data sheet when selecting one. Another important remark is that this model is fitted in the 1 MHz to 3 GHz range, so expect the inaccuracy of this model to grow outside of that range. The whole idea behind ferrite beads is that they are very lossy limiting resonances. These losses are created by the resistors that you see everywhere in the model. However, is this enough? Let's look at the usual application of ferrite beads so we can start to investigate this. This schematic shows the general use of ferrite beads in a power supply, a pi filter structure. It's called a pi filter structure because, well, it looks like a pi symbol. The idea here is that if you place a ferrite bead in between two capacitors, you get a lot of extra filtering due to the high impedance. You want such a pi filter to have two characteristics. First, a high suppression for signals going from the supply to the IC without resonances. Second, a low output impedance of the network without resonances as well. So the IC sees a low impedance. When the IC sees a low output impedance without resonances, the noise it injects into the supply will not cause a higher noise or ringing voltage on the supply as a result. But how do we measure that? You can use a QA401 audio analyzer for measuring these networks. It can be used to measure the gain from the output port to the input port. You'll need two setups for this. The first one measures the suppression from the supply to the load. The second one measures the impedance that the load sees. Both setups use external 50 ohm terminators to ensure both sides of the Pi filter are terminated with 50 ohms in all conditions. The output impedance of the QA401 is 50 ohms, so that side is already terminated. Here you see what the actual setup looks like, the QA401 and the small test board. The cables are folded up to make the image a bit smaller. When measuring, you separate these as much as possible to limit crosstalk. In the end of the video, I'll show some crucial details how to get this setup to work accurately. So let's have a look at the first measurement on a ferrite supply filter. This network consists of two 2.2 microfarad capacitors and a ferrite bead, the BLM 21AG102. We saw the model of that one earlier in the video. You can see the filtering effects from the input to the load and the output impedance of the network. The purple graph does not show the output impedance directly, it shows the suppression caused by that impedance. A high suppression means a low impedance and the other way around. The idea here is to show resonances in the impedance, which show up as bumps, which can cause problems, not to do an exact impedance measurement. We can clearly see a bump in the filter characteristic and a bump in the output impedance, so this network will cause some ringing in the supply. Let's take a look at a more realistic scenario where the input of such a filter has a much higher capacitance since it is usually connected to the main supply. Now as you can see, this improves the filtering from input to output due to the large capacitance, but it makes the output impedance bump higher and appear at a lower frequency, which feels very counterintuitive. It's easier to see if we put all characteristics in a single graph. I've drawn two white arrows to show which lines belong together since this looks a bit confusing. The difference in filtering from the input to the output is huge, the yellow and blue line. However, the output impedance bump has become 5 dB higher. You would expect an overall improvement for both because of the higher capacitance. 
If you are interested in learning more things like this, you can watch a free one hour module of my course and get a free checklist containing 31 years of my experience totally free. Link is in the description. Let's continue. So what's causing this bizarre behavior? This is where things get really interesting. First, you need to understand that this pi filter is actually a parallel resonator. The ferrite bead behaves like an inductor at these low frequencies. Let me show you an easy way to understand this. In picture one, you see the original schematic. In picture two, it is drawn slightly different, showing those two capacitors are actually in series. In picture three, the ground symbol is removed and the two capacitors are combined into a single one, revealing a parallel resonator. Now, if you want to know at which frequency this resonates, you can fill in the formula by entering the inductance of the ferrite bead and the 1.1 microfarad equivalent capacitance. So now that you get that a pi filter is a resonator, let's see why the impedance has gone up on the load side. To understand this, let's see how a voltage across the inductor splits among the two capacitors at the resonance frequency. In the first schematic, the capacitors have the same value, so the voltage splits equally since both impedances are equal. Do note that the sign of the voltage is different on each side. You can actually use this as a 180 degree phase rotator at the resonance frequency. Now what happens if we make the input capacitor very large? This basically shorts the voltage at the input so all the voltage goes to the output. This also means that the impedance at the output is higher, explaining the higher bump we saw earlier. You can actually use this structure as a transformer at the resonance frequency by tuning the capacitor values on each side to get the voltage transformation that you need. So now that you understand what's going on here, you can also come up with an easy solution. Put large capacitors on both sides. And here you see what happens with 100 microfarad on each side. The yellow trace shows the transfer from input to load. The pink trace shows the output impedance. The bump is much lower now. The larger capacitors reduce the Q factor drastically. If you wonder what I mean, I explain it in another video. Link is in the description. The bump was around minus 12 dB and now it's around minus 42 dB, a 30 dB improvement. What I want to show you next is an effect that contributed to a very expensive fix in RTX video cards. I'll put an article link in the description. What you can see is that the purple line flattens off a bit. This is probably since I'm using normal through-hole aluminium electrolytic capacitors. So I wanted to try and place a standard SMD aluminium capacitor as I expect these to perform better. To my surprise, things got worse. Now standard aluminium capacitors have the worst impedance, almost anything else is better. I did however expect the SMD version to be better than a through-hole version. The white arrows show which lines belong together. TH stands for through-hole and SMD speaks for itself. The difference is more than 10 dB for both both measurements, which is at least a factor of three, showing you the impact of different component types and how you have to pay attention all the time. Something similar happened in the RTX 30 series cards, which forced an expensive redesign. It was not a single cause, but the capacitor choices definitely had something to do with it. Just for completeness, I'm showing both capacitor families I've used in this test, if you want to look up the data yourself. So ferrites will cause resonances because of their inductance, and you can solve that by using high value capacitors. But those are expensive and large, so you may not want that all the time. So is there an alternative? Actually, for certain applications there is. Let's have a look at it. If the current consumption is low enough, you can use a resistor as well instead of a ferrite bead. In this test, a 10 ohm resistor is used instead of a ferrite bead, and you can see this delivers a high suppression from the input to the output as well, which is mostly caused by the large input capacitor in this example. The output impedance is higher than with the ferrite bead, but very friendly. It has no resonances since there is no inductance. The impedance starts to drop from about 15 kHz. This is the low pass frequency of 2.2 microfarad with 10 ohms and the source and load impedances of 50 ohms. By placing using a larger capacitor, you can reduce this frequency, delivering a lower output impedance at lower frequencies and more suppression from input to output. The drawback of a resistor compared to a ferrite bead is that a ferrite bead has a far higher impedance at higher frequencies, making much more suppression there. However, this is not covered by this low frequency measurement, so you can see that advantage here. Before you look at what pitfalls you have to avoid in a measurement setup, let's look at some conclusions on using ferrite beads in the supply and one important property that wasn't covered yet. So should you use ferrites? Well, just look at your circuit design. If it's really sensitive to noise and ringing, you have to make sure you smash the Q factor by using large enough capacitors on each side of the ferrite bead. You could also use a resistor instead of a ferrite bead if you have low power consumption. This will give less suppression, but guarantee you don't get resonances. With a higher power consumption, the voltage drop across the resistor can become too high. However, a 0.1 ohm resistor can still help with filtering with a large low ESR capacitor behind it. 0.1 ohms will still accommodate quite a large current without too much 
much voltage drop. For high power, high transient circuits like CPU or FPGA supplies, using a ferrite is probably a bad idea. You will need too much capacitance to deal with the resonances. In this video, you've seen low frequency measurements since resonance problems can occur there. It does not show high frequency filter responses where ferrites can really shine due to their high impedance there. Maybe this is something for another video. One crucial thing that was not discussed yet is that if you apply a DC current to ferrite beads, their impedance drops. This drop can be up to 90% at only half of the rate of DC current. So you're not getting the suppression you were expecting. Always check the data sheet for this or measure it. So the main message of this video is don't blindly use ferrite beads. Check the performance with simulations, measurements or both, especially if you have a sensitive application. So let's have a look at what pitfalls you need to avoid in order to get accurate measurement results. Here you see both setups again. The QA401 uses DA converters to generate an output signal and AD converters to measure the input signal. AD converters need an input aliasing filter to work properly, but this will create frequency roll-off close to the maximum measurement frequency. This is something you need to measure so you can correct for it. In this graph you see results of a calibration measurement to determine the anti-aliasing response of the QA401 from input to output with a 50 ohm load resistor. We can do useful measurements up to 86.1 kHz where the signal has dropped off by 4.93 decibels. Above that, the suppression is so high that you can't get reliable measurement data anymore. So after you've done a measurement, you have to subtract this calibration characteristic from the measurement data to compensate for it. This is done for all measurements in this video. One of the reasons I had to do the measurements multiple times is a problem with crosstalk between the input and output inside the QA401 when the 20 dB internal attenuator is turned on. You can see the measurement schematic. Just load the in and outputs with 50 ohms and measure the signal transfer. Now ideally there should be no transfer. You should just see a noise floor. With the attenuator turned off, you see a slight crosstalk at high frequencies. With the attenuator turned on, however, this becomes much worse, seriously reducing the dynamic range above 40 kHz. I was doing the first measurement run with the attenuator turned on, so I had to debug where this came from, and then do it again with the attenuator turned off. So you might be wondering why there is much more crosstalk. There is a logical explanation. The QA401 has a 100 kilo ohm input impedance. This means that a 20 dB attenuator is made with a 10 kilo ohm and a 90 kilo ohm resistor. This causes the impedance of the signal to go from less than 50 ohms to up to 10 kilo ohms. Such a high signal impedance means that even the slightest parasitic capacitance between the traces of the output and this signal trace will cause crosstalk. And this is exactly what we see here. What could make things worse is that this signal might be present inside a relay. You can hear it clicking when switching the attenuator. This means it's sticking out above the PCB, far from the ground plane, making it an even better antenna for receiving interference. So now you've learned a thing or two about what to watch out for when using ferrites. Capacitors can also have some really nasty surprises that can ruin your circuit if you're not aware of them. You can learn more about that in these two videos. See you in the next one.